And I tell you what, y'all are blessed with some talent around here, aren't you? Amen. Amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of 2 John. The book of 2 John. If you need some help finding that, it's right between 1 John and 3 John. So I'm going to help you there just a little bit. Now, if you haven't found it after about, I'd say, one to two minutes, just stop where you're at. Just kind of hold your Bible together like that, and nobody next to you will be able to know that you're not even there. And then just kind of nod when I'm preaching, raise your hand a little bit, and they'll think you're right on the spot there, okay? The book of 2 John, we're going to look at that in a moment. Let me say, uh, good to be with you today. Uh, Brother Curtis, as you already know, is under the weather, and he uh, called and asked me to uh, come speak today. Nobody else was available. And so I uh, appreciate him uh, looking at me as a last resort to be here this morning. He did, he did command me one thing. He said, do not talk about me in front of my people. Can you imagine him trying to hamper the spirit of the Lord like that this morning? But that's what he did to me. Now... <clears throat> This is going to be a little different. It's different for me, and it's probably going to be different from anything that you've had this morning, and I'm just going to ask you to bear with us for a little bit. I'm going to read the scripture, then what we're going to do, I'm going to play for you a video. Then even after that, I'm going to show you a few slides. And the best way to explain it is kind of like being on an airplane, Brother Brian, you know, long, a lot of times you'll have a long approach, and then you try to stick the landing, right? So that's what we're going to try to do this morning. It's going to be a little long approach here, uh, but I'm going to show you some things this morning that are a little humorous, but I promise you I'm going to make a point with those. So, you know, if, you just, if you're back there and you're one of those people like, this is silly. Uh, well, that's, that's fine. It is silly. Just sit there and be a good Christian and keep it to yourself and don't bother anybody else this morning, all right? <laughs> all right, the book of First John, or Second John, forgot where I'm at. We're going to read the first three verses just to start with, all right? The elder unto the elect lady and her children. Now, the elder is John. This is probably John the Apostle. There have been some debate down through history, but I think most people have landed upon it's the Apostle John who wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and wrote the book of Revelation. He wrote this somewhere around 95 AD, so it's probably just prior to him being exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And so when he's talking about the elder, he's referring back to himself. And he says, I write this to the elect lady. Now, that's just a term there that really means to the Christian lady and to her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all they that have known the truth. For the truth's sake which dwelleth in us shall be with us forever. Grace be to you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. All right, just want you to watch this little video. Like I said, a little silly video, but just watch it because it's going to make a point for us in a moment. Previously on Church Hunters. This is your first church. This is Creekside First Baptist. Honestly, right up front, uh, didn't love the name. The Sunday morning experience was just a little too traditional. Hey guys, how we doing? Hey, good. Doing how are good, you? Doing good, doing good. So I know you didn't love the traditional vibe of the last place, okay? Yeah. okay. But I think this church is really going to do it for you. Yeah. It takes relevance to a whole new level. Behind me, you will see molded clay, jar art, tapestry, canvas, mosaic wow. church. Mm, I love beautiful. it. Right? So you've, you've heard of interdenominational. Mm -hmm. right. And you've heard of non-denominational. Mm -hmm. Well, this church identifies as interdenominational. Wow. Wow, that's, that's perfect for it. us. It really is. But here's the kicker. A lot of celebrities go here. Yeah. What? Jeff Foxworthy. Oh. <laughs> we love him. Yep. We really do. Ben Higgins from ABC's The Bachelor. <gasps> perfect. Several Real Housewives. Ooh, I and love Usher even came here one time. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, wow. well, follow me. Come on. Let's do it. So refreshing. Honestly, that last trip was just way too traditional. It was yeah. too much. It was like we left there feeling convicted. Like, uh, ugh, right? Right. We're just, we're looking for more of a Tony Robbins type stuff. Like inspiration, like a TED Talk with a Bible verse. Yes. Oh, yes. Right? 
it's perfect here. We love it. It really is. We love it. Awesome. Cool. Well, you guys know a lot of contemporary pastors speak out of the Message Translation Bible, mm -hmm. right? or this pastor speaks out of a brand new translation. It's the Tumblr Bible. Oh, Shut we love Tumblr, up. though. This is great. Wow. A lot of emojis, a lot of abbreviations. Oh, I couldn't ask for one. And how many seats in here? Oh, it is 6,000 altogether. Babe, 6,000. Wow. I got to be in this worship band. That's Imagine true. me up on that jumbotron mid guitar solo. Do you know how many Instagram likes you get? Oh, oh my gosh. We find it hard to find a church right now because I grew up Catholic. I grew up Baptist, so. So, like, we, we drink. Yeah, but in private. I mean, obviously you get it. Basically, in terms of like worship, I think we're looking for like a Jesus culture type feel. Oh, I right. love them. At Hillsong, obviously. Oh, obviously, leading you to the cross? Hillsong is great. Like a Bethel minus the spontaneous yeah. stuff. Yeah. Just for me, I connect in worship more when the leader is attractive. Personally, I'm a Carrie Job guy. Oh, okay. Well, she's married. Um, so is Christian Stanfield. So one of my personal favorite things about this church is the service times. Okay. There's an 8.30, a 10, a 1 o'clock, a 5.30, and even a 7 o'clock service. Oh, there's nothing around like 2-ish? Yeah, for us, for what we need, 2, 2.15 is best. Yes. Uh, how many songs do they do during worship? Usually five, five and a half, depending on where the spirit leads. Oh, wow, babe, is that, is that a lot? Well, if that's too that much for you, like they have a program here called the Worship Assist Program. Okay. So if you ever get tired during worship, an intern will come out and just hold your arms up. You just keep worshiping the King of Glory. Just like that, wow. I love it. Oh, you can still look super spiritual. Hmm? And my arms get so tired from yoga. Oh, same. I actually like this church. I think we can make it work. It was all right. I mean, it was a, it was good, but pers like I emailed the pastor and he didn't immediately respond. So uh, we're taking these vessels elsewhere. Oh, that to you, because it's it, it's really it's it's silly, it's funny, but it's really indicative of what we're seeing today in the church. You know, we're we're being a little sarcastic, uh, uh, but it's what we're seeing. I did not realize, and I don't know if you've realized this or not. I I, I didn't know, and I'm a techie guy. I mean, all that's what I do now. I, I basically have a website, and I work with churches and nonprofits, food pantries, ministries all across the country. So that's what I do. I'm working with uh, Christian people across the country as they're ministering to society and to those that are less fortunate. And so I'm kind of up on this stuff, but I didn't realize that there are Google and Yelp reviews on church. Did you know that? When people leave church, they go get on their phones and they post reviews of the church. Did anybody else realize they did that? I, I didn't know they did that till this week. You realize that? Well, I'm going to share with you just a few, and I'll take just a few minutes here, probably maybe about three minutes or so, but I want to share with, and I'm not going to look at the five-star reviews, all those that are like, oh, Jesus is great here, everybody loves God. I'm going to look at the one-star reviews on some churches. Now, I didn't look at, well, I did look at churches around here, but part of the problem with that is most churches only have two or three. So evidently, people in East Tennessee don't know how to use their iPhone still yet today, and they don't know how to do that. But I want to look at the, look at this one. These are from Nashville. Some, most of these are. Right after my mom's service, they called the lawyer's office within three hours wanting to know how much money the, she had left the church. Can you imagine that? Doing the poor lady's funeral, and the first thing you do is hop on the phone and try to call and to find out how much that had left the church. Let's look at the next one. So some of these are about the church and some of them are just about people. I like this. The church is lovely and quaint. Visited, got three stars. Visited for a friend's baby dedication. They had a guest pastor during my visit. He was competent and well received. You know, that's every pastor or preacher's dream to, for somebody to look at you and say, you were competent this morning. You know, just next week when Curtis is up standing in the back or whatever, just go by, pat him on the back, say, Preacher, you were really competent this morning. <laughs> I had one lady several years ago, she walked out of the church, and she shook my hand. She said, Preacher, I just want you to know that you're 100% better than when you first came. <laughs> the thought that went through my mind was, I must have been awful to be a zero or she doesn't know math, one of the two. Let's look at the next one. Uh, I like this. 
They raided the church on this. I visited here to vote. Now, I'm not raiding this church on anything other than a voting location. And the voting was set up in the basement, and the church had access in and out. And it, the area was undersized. And in my opinion, for polling, it's just not a good place, is basically what she said. So she's raiding a church based on if it's good to go vote or not. Let's look at the next one. Worst experience ever. When my boy was 23 months old uh, and there, we had to cancel his admission just in two days of the class. The reason? He would cry. Folks, I've never seen a 23-month-old kid that didn't cry for some reason or another, but because that kid cried, they had to take that kid out of the Sunday school and move on. Let's look at another one. I like this. <clears throat> This is interesting. Maury Davis, the senior pastor, brutally murdered Joella Lyles, a 54-year-old Sunday school teacher, after claiming a jailhouse conversion he pursued, and he pursued a defense that blamed what he did on insanity, drug use, uh, and the devil. You know, first thing that popped in my mind on this was, I thought our, our association, the Appalachian, I thought we had a low bar for ordaining people. Can you imagine that association there that they took in this fellow? But I want to say this in all, in all likelihood. I actually went, after I saw this, to listen a little bit about him and hear his testimony. And uh, I really think he probably, uh, uh, he got saved. He, God did something to him. But notice what these people are. They're not listening to the word. They weren't looking at a changed life. They were just looking at something that happened in his past. You know, what if we always looked at everything in our past? You know, there's probably not a one of us be here this morning because we'd be too ashamed of what we've done in the past. Now, let's show the next slide. And the next slide, ironically, is the, uh, actually the same church. And so this person said, thank you, Cornerstone, for having this play area in our community to share. It's a clean and safe environment for all to enjoy. My girls love coming there. You know, so it's not about, oh man, they really heard about Jesus. They really, man, they got a great playground in that church. That's where we're taking our family. Let's look at the next one. I love this. The daycare lost my friend's child. <laughs> they try to have a good professional system here, but anybody can walk in and out of the daycare. For such a huge church, you want to feel like you can leave your child and feel no harm to them. They had no idea where her 15-month-old was. They finally found her in a locked bathroom when she's not even potty trained yet. <laughs> and uh, I'll just let you know whose church that is. That's, uh, that's a big church in Texas and Houston. And you might know the fella down there because he's always talking about being positive. And uh, I'm wondering what he told that lady when they couldn't find the kid. Oh, it's all right. They'll grow up in church. We won't know where they are, but they'll grow up in church. I got to tell you, go home today and Google Joel Osteen Pharmacist and watch that. Just, just go Google Joel Osteen Pharmacist and watch that. Let's look. I think that we have, uh, I forget where I'm at here. Oh yeah, I love this. This I saw this in California last night. You got to read this. We've been huge Hillsong worship fans, and we were so excited to be in California so we could attend the service. We we're surprised when we entered the auditorium at the downtown LA, LA location. The smell was not good. We were surprised when we entered the auditorium. Oh, excuse me. We understand it was an old building, though. As people started entering and the worship team started singing, the overwhelming smell of weed was ridiculous. <laughs> and not what you would expect at church. <laughs> Two of the four of our group were recovering addicts, and it was so strong and wasn't going away or lightening up after the four or five worship songs we decided to leave at that point. Now, I understand it's legal in California, but you don't expect people to be drinking or drunk at church, just as we didn't expect to get a contact high. You know, isn't that something? You go to church as an addict, and what do you do? You come out a worse addict after being... <laughs> at the church all day long. You know, it's just, uh, you know, I, I've, never had a, a, I've never had a drink in my life. Uh, I've never touched it. You know, it would be awful to go to church and that'd be my first experience with drinking or with marijuana. Now, I say all that and I look at this just to let you know that this is what the church is dealing with in the 21st century. You know, when we talk about we need to reach out, we need to try to get people, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying somehow, and not all, but some churches are trying to market themselves 
to make themselves more appealing to an outside crowd, specifically probably the millennial crowd. The millennial crowd is kind of born in the 80s to 90s. And if you look at statistics, it's only about 56 to 59 percent of millennials even consider themselves religious. It's about 20 percent less, I think, of that that even go to church on a somewhat regular basis. And it is, it seemingly seems to be like because they're so needy in what they want and what they're looking at for church. But I want you to know that I think there's a great disconnect between what people want in a church, a disconnect between what the church is trying to be today and what the church ought to be according to the Word of God. You know, I titled this The Church PC or BC. Now, we know what PC is. That means the politically correct culture. Now, that doesn't mean just to deal with politics. It's a term that's broader than that. It means basically in, uh, that we don't offend anybody or try to hurt anybody's feelings because that's wrong in this day and age. I liked in that little video what he said, well, that last church we went to, but we left feeling convicted. People don't like to feel convicted anymore over their sin. They just like to feel okay. Like, we went to church and you made me feel better. And, and to be honest with it, that's part of the problem with churches like a Joel Osteen or other churches like that. You know, it's all about positive thinking. You have the answer in yourself. Well, I'm here to tell you, we don't have the answer in ourselves Because we were, we were created, but then we became a fallen creation, and we have a sin nature. And that sin nature does not allow us to have the answer within ourselves. The only answer we have is found in the Word of God. And so, that's what we want to look at here briefly today. You know, if Christ wasn't looking down on the church, and I know, he, I know he is, but let's just say from the moment he ascended back into heaven, he never looked once back at the church. He just kind of stayed to himself and he let everything kind of go along as it should, and he never looked down upon the church. Now, you do have to realize it was Christ that started the church. I hope you understand that. I know you get good Bible preaching, you get good teaching here. Uh, but in Matthew 16, let me just reiterate it. It said, and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. For a long time, it, plus, especially in Catholicism, they all thought that Peter was the founder of the church, and that's just not true. Jesus Christ is the founder of the church. If you look at that back in the Greek, you're going to see the word for Peter is Petros. And if you look at the word for rock, the word is Petra. And there's just a slight difference in the Greek, but the meaning is different. Petros, when he looked at Peter, it basically means a small sliver or a piece of a rock. But when you look at the word Petra, when he said upon this rock, I'll build my church, that is a, an enormous rock, a foundation type stone. So what he was doing, and sometimes it's hard in the Bible probably to get the picture of this because we just read it and we're not seeing what was going on, the context at that time, but it was probably more like this. You are Peter, but upon this rock I will build my church. So the church is to be built upon Jesus Christ. So let's say he's not had anything to see with the church since he started it and then he ascended back into heaven. Now, 2,000 years later, he comes back. Let me ask you this question. Do you believe that Christ would even recognize the church today? I probably tend to agree with you. I'm not sure that he would recognize it. But the fact is, he has been looking down. He's been seeing what's going on, taking place. He saw the changes in the church. I'm sure it grieves his heart to a great extent. Now, when we talk about this, of course, I'm not referring to every single church, so don't, you know, don't think I'm doing that. There are a lot of good churches still out there. But what I want to do is look here in the book of 2 John for the next few minutes that we have left. Because in the book of 2 John, and it's just a short book, it's just 13 verses, but he really sums it up and tells us what the purpose of the church is. Now, we have all the epistles in the New Testament that we can look at. We can look at the Gospels, and we can see a lot more detail about what we should do and how we should act, some people that did things wrong and how God would like us to do things different. But in John here, he really just sums it up for us to make it easy. I believe that the Christian life is not that complicated. 
I'm not saying it's easy, but it's not complicated to understand what we're to do as a Christian. Here, let's look at this and go on here and, uh, and read. And let me say when we talk about the church, I want you to understand there's really kind of about, about, about three things about the church. First of all, we have the universal church. The universal church is everybody that's ever lived and died in Christ. They're a part of that universal church. But then the Bible also talks about the local church. That is the local gathering of people. And then thirdly, that would be you and I as individual Christians because that's what the church is. It's made up of individual Christians. And so, as you've heard before, the church is no stronger than each individual Christian that makes it up. That means this, if you're a weak point in this church, then you hurt this church. So that's what we mean. We have the universal church, we have the local church, and then we have each individual church. And God gave his life, Christ gave his life for us to start this. So when we see John talking here, he's really talking to us as individuals and collectively as well. In verse 3 that we read a second ago, he ended with the phrase truth and love. Truth and love. And there's no coincidence in that. He just didn't pull that out of the air. But he wrote this letter to this lady and uh, talking to her about her children, how good they had done, they were in Christ. But he said that we need to walk in truth and love. And that's simply because those two cannot be separated. You can't love somebody if you're not adhering to the truth of Jesus Christ. And you can't adhere to the truth of Jesus Christ without loving people. It's impossible. The two absolutely go hand in hand. In verse 4, he says this. He says, And I rejoice greatly that I found thy children walking in the truth as we received a commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, Christian lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto you, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, and ye should walk in it. You know, here we're looking at John telling us that we should be practicing the truth. We should be practicing it in our daily life. If you'll notice in that passage that we read, the repetition of the word walk. He's saying that the Bible, the Word of God, this truth is not something that we simply listen to and take in, but it's something that we put into practice and we walk daily. You know, if you look at this, uh, the, the, the absolute fact is, is that it's not enough just to know the truth. We have to show it through our actions wherever we are. Christian love is not just an emotion that we work up. It's a simple obedience to God. You know, sometimes we come to church and we're like this. We think that living for Jesus is just on Sunday morning. You know, I, I come in and I'm all smiles and I'm hugging all God's people. And, you know, it's just good to be here and hear all the music. And we think that I've done my duty. But when he's talking about walk, it's a continual walk wherever that you are. Let me tell you, I can tell you how you can know if you have a problem with this. If you come in here today and you're all happy, you're waving your hands, you're lifting your hands, the worship assist team will be there if you need them to hold your hands up longer. But uh, if, if you're happy and you're having it, and then you leave and you get in your car and you get back on I-26, and somebody cuts you off and all of a sudden you be sharing some things that aren't really Christian words to them, you're probably having a problem walking in the truth. If you're here today, and this is going to be a big one, but if you're here today and you don't love everybody in this church, you have a problem. Oh, no, he's gone to meddling now, hasn't he? He stopped the preaching. He stopped all the good stuff. He's like, you're thinking, preacher, show another video before you get in trouble here. That's what John's saying, that we should love everybody. Now you're saying, Brother Phil, do you love everybody? I wish you hadn't asked me that question. <laughs> I think I do. But I'm going to tell you, it ain't always easy, is it? You say, who do you have problems with? There is one group of people that I really have a problem with. I have a problem with stupid people. <laughs> now... If you're here today and you fall in that category, 
I'm going to do my hardest to love you today despite that. It's just when people say stupid things, it just really, and there's something in me, I don't, you know, I've got a pretty good filter except when people say stupid things. And I just have to share stupidness back with them at that point. Uh, I remember one time I was in church and uh, the choir practice was going and I walked behind this lady and I just, I just being nice, you know, pastorally friendly and I tapped her on the shoulder and I said, how you doing, honey? And uh, that's an East Tennessee thing or, you know, Southern thing, honey. And uh, I said, how are you doing? And she said, huh, I'm doing better now, but the preacher wouldn't even come visit me when I'm sick. Now, did she ever tell me she was sick? Did anybody ever call me and let me know she was sick? No. Was that the first I'd ever heard her about her being sick? Yes, it was. So my response, it was, I just tapped her on the shoulder and I said, hey, don't worry about it. I don't go visit anybody. And I got up and walked away. <laughs> uh, you'll notice I'm still looking for a church, uh, a pastor. <laughs> But honestly, it's sometimes it, it's hard loving people. I get it. But even if we disagree with them, even if we don't like everything that we do, we're called to love them. You know, sometimes we just have to realize one of two things. Either some people have not attained spiritually to the same point we are, or maybe we're not quite as spiritual as we think we are. We're called to love everybody. And I'm going to tell you, I believe that's one of the key components that's missing in the church today. They ask, why does the church not grow? Why do people not come into the church nowadays? And I would submit to you that I think one of the major obstacles is not necessarily, it doesn't have the right name, it doesn't have the greatest worship band, it doesn't have coffee uh, places outside and donuts, and I love coffee, I love donuts, not saying any of that stuff's wrong, but we forgot about some of the main things. And the main thing that John says here first is that we need to love one another. Matter of fact, in John 14, his gospel, he said this, if you, uh, and he's quoting Jesus, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Wherever there's a sincere love for God's word, there will be a sincere love for God's people as well. You cannot separ separate loving the truth and loving God. You can't say I'm a good Christian and not love everybody else in the church and love people. You can't get up and testify how good God is and how wonderful he is when you have malice in your heart towards somebody else in your church. Let's go look at this, practicing the truth. Now look at protecting the truth. That's what he tells this dear lady. First thing is you've got to practice this. On a daily basis, you've got to practice loving one another and keeping the truth. And here he talks about protecting the truth. He said in John, uh, 2 John 1, 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. If you look at the book of 1 John, he actually talked about antichrist there. If you go to the book of 3 John, he mentions somebody, Diotrephes, that was basically an antichrist. He was a deceiver. He was teaching doctrine that was something else. One of the things that we see today in church is, uh, and like I said, not talking about every church, but a lot of churches, the ones you see on TV, the ones you hear, what we're seeing is this, is they're not as concerned about staying faithful to the Word of God as they are to building an audience or a TV audience or bringing in money to be able to pay for those massive facilities that they have. You know, I used to think large churches are good, and I'm not saying they're bad. I'm not saying, I mean, there are a lot of good ones out there. But I heard somebody one day on TV, and they were talking about the problem with a lot of the large mega churches is this. They've gotten so debt, in debt with those massive structures that they don't have any money left to do ministry. I'm going to submit to you this. I believe the church is for the edification of the saints. What that means is the teaching, the equipping of the saints, teaching you how to be a Christian. But I'm also a firm believer that ministry is outside the church. We come here to learn about Christ so we can take it outside the walls and to share it with other people. 
through what? Our love and our concern for them. You know, I, I'm a firm believer that I, I think most people that are really looking for something, that's what they're looking for. It's some place they can feel loved. That they can come in and not feel like people are going to gossip about them or talk about them. Maybe because of the way they dress, the way they look. Maybe in some instances the way they smell. But they're not going to judge them on that, but they're going to be accepted and they're going to be loved. You know, I was thinking the other day, it's interesting. Can anybody here tell me what church building Jesus Christ ministered in? You know why you can't tell me? There wasn't one. There was never a building like this for Jesus. And he started it. Is the first thing he did was he get the guys together and get a mission statement and get a plan together and then get the architects to draw a building together so they could erect that building so they could get people to come in and hear Jesus preached? Matter of fact, do you know that gatherings like this didn't even start till the third century? They met in people's homes. It was just a few people getting together and maybe an apostle might come by, another teacher might come by, and might share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ and begin to teach them about how to be a Christian. Matter of fact, this letter, you'll notice it was to a lady. It wasn't to a church. So more than likely, she was having meetings in her home where people were coming to learn about Jesus Christ. But he's saying even in that small group, you've got to be careful because there are those deceivers that will come and try to add to the Scripture or take away from the Scripture. You know, doesn't it seem like sometimes when you're watching all these people on TV, it seems like they're always trying to get a new twist on the Scripture. They're trying to figure out something new and compelling that they can say. You know, I'm kind of like Solomon. Solomon basically said there's nothing new under the sun. You know, these Scriptures are the same ones that have been being preached for 2,000 years. I'm pretty sure I can't find anything new in there to tell you. And if you expect Curtis to find something new in there, he ain't going to find it. But why do we come then? Because sometimes just because we heard it doesn't mean we're practicing it yet. And so we need to hear it again and again and again. And we need to get it redone. You know, it's like you got a car, you buy a car, you got to go change the oils every once in a while. You got to change the tires every once in a while. You can't just let that go. And Brother Charlie would like you to buy a new one every once in a while. But, you know, uh, you've got to upkeep that car if you want it to go. And you come to church for your upkeep, to keep you going in Christ, and also to have all those that love you edify you and build you up and help you during those tough times. So he goes on. i got to hurry. He says in John chapter, uh, or 2 John chapter 1, verse 8, I say chapter 1, there's only one chapter. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we are wrought, but that we receive a full reward. John's warning them, saying basically, you got to watch out for false teachers. These ones that will come in, try to add or take away, they try to come up with something new because what they will do, they will destroy you. By destroying you, I mean this. They'll take away all that progress that you have made in Jesus Christ. Have you ever seen somebody come into church and all of a sudden everybody becomes friends with them? They seem like a wonderful person. But all of a sudden they start taking away from the church. They start maybe going against the pastor or the leadership. Next thing you know, they've got their own little group. And then the next thing you know after that, they take them away. And more times than not, you'll see them within about six months to a year disband altogether. The reason is they followed that deceiver, that destroyer. And all the progress they made in Jesus Christ has been wiped away and destroyed. And that's what John is warning about there. Be careful of those who destroy. The easiest way to get deterred from your Christian walk is to get involved with false doctrine. Whether it's on the TV, whether it's on the radio, or it might be some other teaching, that's the easiest way to get deterred. Now, lastly here, notice those who depart. In John, 2 John, verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. The word transgress means to go beyond. You know, that's really kind of going back to that point of adding on to. You know, when some people got to go beyond and do things more. So we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this. Let me explain to you. It's not wrong to have a nice building. It's not wrong to have a good program. 
It's not wrong to have a fancy different name on a church. You know, we see those and sometimes we think, oh, they shouldn't do it. It's not wrong to do those things necessarily. What's wrong is when those things become more important than the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. And somehow that's what happens with us as humans. We get a little bored because we think, well, I've already heard that. It's the same thing I've already heard that preaching for. Maybe we ought to try to do something to bring other people in. Let's get a big hot air balloon and let's take them up in hot air rides. You know, let's do this and do that. And we think somehow that's going to bring them to Jesus Christ. And more times than not, it does not do anything to get them into the church and get them saved. Several years ago, I was here back when uh, Curtis had the uh, office back where the nursery is now, I think. And I'd gone in. He said, read this. He got a letter. And it was like, honestly, it was like three pages long. And it just said, we visited your church and we're thinking about coming and we want to know what you can do for us. Do you do this? And honestly, it was three pages long of item after item after item after item after item. And he said, what do you think about that? I said, I'd write her back one line. I said, what can you do for our church? You know, we all seem to be, not all of us, but it, it seems like in this day and age, we just want to be takers and not givers. These false teachers, that's what they are. It's all about them. You know, and sometimes they can hide in pretty good clothing. I saw a fellow last night when I was looking through some videos and that. He's a preacher, and I could tell he's probably Baptist. You can just kind of tell. He's probably one of those old hardline Baptists. But I don't know if I've ever met anybody as hardline as him. He started preaching, and he looked out, and he picked somebody out in the audience, and he said, you, buddy, he said, you're wanting me to do your wedding next week. He said, you ain't even been here to church. Why should I marry you to her? I ain't going to marry you to her. You're worthless. <laughs> then he walks down, and he says, stand up. And the poor little guy stands up, and he says, you know I love you, don't you? <laughs> the guy was, uh, <laughs> I think he was mixing up fear and love. I'm not sure at that point. <laughs> he looked at the guy in the video. He said, you back there in the video, I know what you've been doing. I know you've been getting people back there and it's become a youth hangout. You're not going to be hanging out there. He said, I don't care what your mama, your daddy sitting right here. They love me, don't you? And you love me, don't you? I'm thinking, there ain't nobody that loves you at that church. <laughs> we have an odd idea about what love is. But if you want to see what love is, just go see Jesus Christ. Zacchaeus, nobody loves you. Nobody likes you. Can't stand you. Won't you come down? And I'm going to go eat with you today. So that poor woman at the well, not many people liked her either. But he took time out of his schedule to sit down and spend with her. You want to see what love is, go look at Jesus Christ. Look at Christ on the cross. Did he once curse at the soldiers that nailed him there? What did he say as he was going through all that trial? He was carrying his own cross through the streets when they put the crown of thorns on his head. Did he look at him and say, I'll get you back, you just wait. If I remember right, I think he said something along the lines of, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Maybe if we loved one another, instead of being judgmental about one another, we would just look and say, well, Father, just forgive them. They're young. They just don't get it. And maybe we'd say, God, forgive me for having an ill thought. As I said, it's not that complicated. Just love one another and strive to maintain the truth of God's Word. During World War II, Hitler commanded all the religious groups to unite and come together. And he did it for one reason. He wanted to control them. If he, could, he did a couple things. He did away with the books. He did away with the weapons. And he did certain things that the people could not rise up against him. And then he commanded the religions because he knew the religious had great authority and power with the people. And so he commanded them to come together. So a lot of those brethren assemblies, they did consolidate. But a lot of them resisted. Of those who resisted, they faced harsh persecution. In almost every family of those that resisted, someone died in a concentration camp. 
But when the war was over, there were great feelings of bitterness between these two groups. And it ran deep, it ran hard, and it ran long. But finally, they decided that the situation had to be healed. So the leaders from each of those various groups, they decided to get together and they met at a quiet retreat. And for several days, they spent apart from each other, just in solitude and in time and prayer, each examining their own heart in the light of Christ's commands. And then they came back together. Francis Schaeffer, a theologian some years ago, I mean, like the 70s, 80s, was popular, and he's the one that told of this incident. And so he had a friend who was actually there in that meeting post-World War II. And he asked him, he said, well, what did you guys do? And the fellow said this, he said, we were just one. After we confessed our hostility, our bitterness to God, and we yielded to his control, the Holy Spirit created a spirit of unity among them. And the love filled their hearts, and it dissolved their hatred. As I mentioned, God loves the church, the local church, but it's the individuals that make it up. You'll never be stronger than the bounds of your love for one another. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I, I don't know anything about you. Most of you, I couldn't even tell you your name. There's some that I've known over the years I could, but to be honest with you, most of you, I, I couldn't tell you your name. I don't know who you are. I don't know anything about you, so don't think that I have an agenda or anything like that. I just have what God laid on my heart for the service. But I want you to ask yourself two questions. First one is this. Am I truthful to the scriptures, to the doctrine of Christ, to the Bible? Am I solid on my doctrine, on my theology? My guess is most of you are probably going to think, yeah, I believe I am. And you're in a good church. You're in a good Bible-believing church. So if you come here, I know you're hearing it. So that's what John says. Walk in that truth. But he also said, walk in love. So now what I want to ask you is this. Can you honestly say that you love everybody in this church? Do you love anybody in this church? And all you got to do to find that out is real quick, just say, Holy Spirit, is there somebody I'm not right with? Is there somebody I've harbored ill feelings against? Is there somebody? I got news for you. The Holy Spirit's powerful enough that he's already brought that to your mind. So you now know the answer to that. But not only are you hindering the work of Christ in your own life, you're hindering the work of Christ in the church as well. Now I'm just going to do this. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. I'm not going to pick you out. I ain't going to come to you after service. That's, that's not what I do. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. But if there are any here this morning say, Brother Phil, I just need you to pray for me. I got some things in my life that God showed me this morning and I just want you to pray that I can overcome those and that I could have victory in some certain areas. Just slip your hand up and just put it back down really quick. Yes, yes. Several hands already. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Any others? Real quick, I see that. I see that hand. I know they don't do this in the contemporary churches, but that's okay. Just a couple more seconds. Anybody else say, Brother Phil, just pray for me. I just need prayers. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. God bless you. I saw that.